Thank you for joining us. My name is Barry Erickson and I'm Community en Engagement Coordinator here at Wheaton Public Library. Tonight, we are proud to bring you Breast Health Basics. Approximately one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. Community Outreach Nurse Michelle Schleiben from Northwestern Medicine is here to inform us about risk factors, current screening guidelines, and what you can do to reduce your risk. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, Michelle. Thank you, Mary. And um, I am excited to be a part of um, this program tonight. I'm excited to share Breast Health Basics with you. Um, my uh, history is actually, um, I, I've been in maternal child health for years, and I also um, have been in maternal I was maternal child health and then women's health as well. So I've, I've worked in both of those areas. Um, and tonight we're going to focus on breast health basics. So this program is, is really geared toward prevention. Um, it is a basics program. So we're hoping that the majority of this information you have heard, and it's not new to you, um, hopefully you learn a few new things. But the majority of this, we're hoping you've already heard, and it's just a refresher for you. So um, let's look at some of the objectives for tonight's program. We're going to talk about some key statistics of breast cancer, um, some current screening recommendations, some common myths and facts regarding breast cancer, uh, the average breast cancer risk factors, and then what we can do to impact those risk factors. So let's start talking about what breast cancer actually is. Um, just like any other cancer, breast cancer is unregulated cell growth in the breast. And it can start in one breast or it can start in both breasts. Um, it is most frequently diagnosed in women age 50 or older. Um, however, 11% of women are actually under the age um, of 45. So it is important to talk about breast cancer at a very young age. And I think that we fail to do this sometimes in healthcare. Um, I personally feel like we should be talking about this with our adolescent um, children and um, male and female, because men can also get breast cancer. Um, I have a, a, a 11 year old or a 10 year old little girl and we've already started conversations about the importance of screenings and um, what that looks like because you really can't start soon enough. Um, you know, I, I think that sometimes we think because we don't have any family history or no one close to us have had breast cancer that we don't have to be concerned. Um, but 85% of breast cancer cases are actually in women that do not have family history. So I think the awareness um, about breast cancer, we, we've seen people who've had breast cancer, we know that it affects not only the individual that has cancer, but also the entire family. So um, we want to advocate and really um, start telling our adolescents about this as well. So the next thing we're going to talk about is some statistics for breast cancer. So breast cancer is one of the most commonly diagnosed cancers among American women, um, and that's second only to skin cancer. So, um, you know, we're, we're in the sun a lot. We <laughs> like to be outdoors. Um, so skin cancer is very common, but breast cancer is actually the, the second, um, the second uh, cancer that is, affects us the most. And then for women in the U.S., breast cancer death rates are higher than those for any other cancer besides lung cancer. Um, and I mentioned earlier, you know, men can also get breast cancer. It only accounts for about 1% of all breast cancer cases. However, it is important that we are educating our young men on the importance of, you know, just knowing what their body is and what, what it, you know, if there's something new, we need to identify that and we need to, you know, encourage them to get help. Um, often breast cancer in men is, di is actually diagnosed like age 60 to 70. So it's later in life, but this is definitely something we still need to be talking about. Um, a woman's risk of breast cancer nearly doubles if she has a first degree relative. So that would be a mother or a sister or a daughter um, that's been diagnosed with breast cancer. If that is the case, your, your risks are doubled. And about five to 10% of breast cancers can be linked to gene mutations. So a common gene mutation that most of you have probably heard of is BRCA1, BRCA2. Um, and this is a mutation that um, often we, 
we talk about when talking about breast cancer or ovarian cancer. Um, my mother actually had breast cancer, or I'm sorry, had ovarian cancer and was diagnosed at age 58. Um, and because she was so young and she actually, she unfortunately, she did not make it. She passed away. Um, it was very important that the, the BRCA1, BRCA2 testing was done so that she knew, number one, if she carried that gene and um, for my sake, if indeed I needed to be um, even more concerned and have more screenings because of that. Fortunately, she was not, she did not carry that gene. Um, but even for myself, I need to also have that done for my daughter's sake. So it's important that if it runs in the family, you have that testing done um, because there is an increased risk if um, those gene mutations are present. And then less than 15% of women who get breast cancer have a family member diagnosed with it. So um, I mentioned this earlier, but you know, I think sometimes we're lulled into thinking because we don't have any family history that we don't need to worry about it so much. But unfortunately, 85% of breast cancers occur in women who have no family history of breast cancer. So how common is breast cancer? Well, unfortunately, one in eight women will end up getting um, breast cancer. And you know, that's about 13% of women. So um, it's not, it's not the, the best statistic um, <laughs> or the best stat, you know, but we, we do have to look at the positive side too. That means that seven and eight women will not um, end up with breast cancer. And I think really the most important thing is knowing how we can impact those risks. So education, um, as well as screenings can help us impact our risks and make sure, you know, making sure that we're having those screenings early and frequently and we're aware of our body, um, that's going to help us because the sooner we find something, the, um, the greater outcome for each individual. Okay, so we've talked about our risk factors. We talked about some um, of the statistics with breast cancer. Now we're going to actually talk about um, the recommended screening. So, in this slide, you can see that the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, the American College of Radiology, and the American Medical Association, they all recommend starting your um, mammograms at age 40. The American Cancer Society actually recommends age 45, um, but I personally would recommend that you start at age 40. And the reason why is because the sooner we have our mammograms done, um, number one, the, the um, better chance we're going to catch something sooner, right? If we start earlier, we might catch something sooner. And then we also can compare. So say this year I have a mammogram and then next year I have a mammogram. Each year they can compare those to the previous year. So it's really important to start early. Um, and I think, you know, not only doing your mammograms, but your self exams is also important. And we'll go into depth a little more um, with the self exams as well here in a few slides. So what is a mammogram? Most of you probably know a mammogram is really just an x-ray of the breast and it's the only screening exam that's proven to reduce breast cancer mortality. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really the most important tool to not only diagnose, um, but to evaluate and follow up with breast cancer as well. And a few things to kind of think about when you're getting your mammogram, um, especially when scheduling is, you know, making sure that you're not scheduling during your menstrual period. Um, and the reason why is because our breasts are already sensitive during that time frame. So, you know, when you think about a mammogram, there's going to be some pressure. Um, and, and so it's important that you kind of schedule that mammogram a week after your menstrual period so that you're not so sensitive. Um, and I think you'll you'll feel better too when you're getting the you know the mammogram done. Um, one of the qu common questions is you know is it going to hurt? Uh, does a mammogram hurt? Um, mammograms have come a long way. I know that 50 years ago, um, probably <laughs> a totally different experience, but they really have come a long way. And we try to um, balance the amount of pressure needed to get a good X-ray of the breast as well as the comfort for the patient um, to ensure that, you know, we, we get a good x-ray, but the patient is also comfortable. And, you know, it's hard to say like if a mammogram hurts because we have all have a different pain tolerance. Um, we all have different breast tissue. And so, 
it, it's it's a tough question to say does a mammogram hurt um, because some people say oh it's it's fairly uncomfortable others say oh it's fine it's not a big deal um, and sometimes I associate it with going to the dentist and having the bite wing put in you know so it's not comfortable um, some positions hurt more than others but it only takes just a little bit of time and then you know you're done you're through it and everything's okay so it's kind of like a mammogram. Um, Another common question is, you know, what about radiation? Am I, you know, am I receiving a lot of radiation when I receive my mammogram? So again, it's came out, mammograms have came a long way over, you know, the years. So the dose is not zero, but it is very low. It's actually less than what we are exposed to with background radiation um, each year. So this should not deter you from getting a mammogram. Um, and then another common question is just, you know, are they is the mammogram going to find a harmless cancer? Am I going to be worrying about something that I shouldn't be worrying about? And, you know, yes, it can find something that may never spread. However, that is, you know, often that is less than 10% of all cancers found on a mammogram. So this also should not deter you from getting a mammogram. And it's better to be safe than find out later, you know, that you didn't have something um, looked at and now it's a stage three and it's much, much harder to, to deal with. Um, I, and I'll, ex I'll just kind of share a personal story with my mom. So she was diagnosed at age 58. Um, she had been seeing a doctor and this was ovarian cancer, but it's, it's still kind of the same idea. Um, she had been seeing a doctor and she had been telling their, them her complaints and they had misdiagnosed her. Um, they thought she had fibromyalgia and um, so they were treating her for that. Um, and she kept pursuing, you know, like, she's like, I don't feel good, this isn't right. Um, and they didn't find the cancer until stage 3C. And so unfortunately for her to, um, to even have, you know, surgery, she had to receive chemo and then she had her surgery and um, it, it, because it had progressed so far, um, unfortunately, you know, she didn't make it. And so it's so important that we're identifying these things early. Um, and, and so I, I can't stress enough the importance of your screenings here, you know, and, and if you're doing a self-exam and you feel something knowing that something's different and I need to have this looked at, don't put it off um, because we know that if we find cancer early, the outcome is much better for each individual. So I share that personal story just so that um, I can stress that importance, you know, and, and sometimes, sometimes things are missed, right? Um, but, you know, we're all human too. And my mom never blamed anyone for that because she said we're all human and, and it just was my time. But, you know, it, I, I just can't stress enough the importance of getting your screenings and making sure you are your own advocate and you are passionate about making sure that if you don't feel right, you know your body, um, you need to make sure that you get answers and um, that you pursue those answers until you find out what's really going on. Okay, so we've talked about a mammogram, we've discussed what that is, and I've mentioned some self um, assessments. So I, I love this video. Um, our very own Dr. Velez is going to talk about what a self breast, what a breast self um, exam is. Um, and, and she goes through and describes, you know, what to look for, um, kind of how to palpate. Um, so I hope you enjoy this, this video and um, we'll recap afterwards. But the, but the main idea in this is just knowing your own lumps and bumps, making sure that you know you're normal so that if anything does arise, um, you can identify that and then, you know, go to a doctor and have it assessed um, right away. So here is our video. Hi, I'm Vanessa Herkert, and today we're going to talk about breast health. Breast health is important to everyone, especially people like me that have a predisposition to breast cancer because of the BRCA2 genetic mutation. I'm so happy to have Dr. Velez here with me today to get me started on how to do a self-breast assessment. Is that the right way to talk about it? That is a much better way to talk about it than historically mm -hmm. when we've been discussing breast exams. Mm -hmm. We want women to be comfortable and we want them to get to know what their breasts feel like without feeling like there is a great deal of pressure to perform an exam. 
And now Dr. Velez is gonna walk me through this process and answer all my questions. So when you're doing a breast self-awareness session, okay, for example, what you wanna start doing is you wanna first just look. You wanna look for asymmetries in the breasts, one size being larger than the other, for example. You wanna look at skin changes, you wanna look for dimpling, you want to look for any sort of puckering of the skin. You wanna look at the nipple to see if it appears flattened or inverted. One of the maneuvers that might actually be helpful in doing that, that would accentuate some of those findings, would be to lift your hands up above your head and press your arms together or to put your arms at your waist and push down. These are uh, movements that make the muscles change or tightened and can sometimes accentuate some of those findings. So step number two is going to be to feel. You want to start off by the clavicle and then you want to gently feel from the periphery towards the nipple. When you're doing the feeling you also want to make sure that you feel with the pads of your finger, the first three fingers on your hand, and you want to use the opposite hand to the breast while you're feeling and you want to use light pressure, you want to use moderate pressure, and you want to use firm pressure all the way around the breast. And once you do it on one side, then you do the same thing to the other side. As part of the exam, you also do want to feel up into the axilla or the armpit on both sides because some of the breast tissue does extend up into that general region. I almost missed my armpit. <laughs> You may have lumps of, or bumps, many women do, but they're your lumps and bumps, and really the important thing is to get to know where those are so that you can identify changes when they occur. Okay, so this is great, but if I see anything mm -hmm. like this, okay. should I call my doctor, freak out, what should I do? Okay, no freaking out, <laughs> absolutely not. So that is your first step in becoming breast aware. Okay. It is quite possible that that lump has been there for quite some time. It is quite possible that that lump is a lump that fluctuates mm -hmm. with your periods and your hormones, but there's no reason to be too scared right away. These are common findings and most of them are gonna be benign. Do you think my physician is gonna think I'm crazy or a worry wart for calling with the simplest questions like these or any worries? So zero judgment. <laughs> we really want all of the women to come in when they find anything that they feel has changed in their breast exam or something they're concerned about. There is absolutely no reason to live in fear mm -hmm. and not knowing sometimes can be very, very stressful for people. So it is okay to just come on in and have a very good discussion uh, with your physician. This is your body. Mm -hmm. You need to know your body. It is going to be a long relationship. <laughs> you have a long time to get to know them, and you have to start. It sounds like what's most important is to make it a habit. That is, in fact, the most important thing. You want to make sure that you do your exam uh, frequently. You want to do it consistently the same way, and you will get very good at knowing your own breasts. My way is to feel it on the first. This is my monthly reminder at the beginning of each month to do my self-breast awareness. That works great. Uh, however, you can feel free to do it anytime you want, and the best time is going to be about a week after your period. Thank you so much for being with me today to teach me and share your expertise, um, not only with me, but with all of our followers, and how to be breast self-aware. Thank you so much for having me. And if you want to schedule an appointment with your physician, don't forget to visit nm.org. Okay, so I hope you learned a little bit um, from that video. I really like that video. I think um, she explains it very well. And since she explained how to do a self um, assessment, I kind of want to go over. Um, what is inside your breast and what are you looking for? So I know that's a question I had um, when I, you know, first started learning about self-assessments and how to do them and all of that. So you're palpating, you're feeling, but what are we actually feeling? What are we looking for? So this um, slide is actually from knowyourlemons.org and it's an organization that is helping spread the awareness of self-assessments and um, mammograms and just the importance of breast health. Um, and I love this slide because it shows, you know, it uses a lemon, number one, as an example um, of our breast. And, and it shows like an areola, the nipple, the milk ducts, the fatty tissue, the skin, all normal things in the breast. And then, on the left-hand side, you can see um, 
there's lymph nodes, milk lobes, and then cancerous lump. So when you're palpating, when you're feeling, if you feel something that feels like a soft bean, um, and it looks like kind of like a kidney bean there in that picture, but similar um, feeling like a soft bean and size, that's probably a lymph node. Uh, if you feel like a pea size, um, uh, shape and it's soft, it's most likely a milk lobe. And then the most important thing is if you're feeling something that's hard and it's not movable, then that could be a cancerous lump. So the lymph nodes, the milk lobes, those are movable, but a, but a, a hard, um, almost like a lemon seed, um, like <laughs> feeling is not good. So, so we want to make sure that if you're feeling that hard, and lemon seed like, um, you know, and it can be any shape and, and size, but if it's hard and it's not movable, that is a sign that we need to have that looked at. And again, you don't need to panic because sometimes um, your, your body, you know, things change a little bit when it's going along with your menstrual period. So um, don't panic, but just definitely make an appointment and have things looked at. Um, so I hope this kind of explains a little bit what you're looking for and it helps you kind of identify what is normal and what is not. And the next slide, um, I like this slide as well. This is kind of another example of what breast cancer can look and feel like. Um, and some of the examples are a thick area on the breast, or maybe you notice dimpling on the breast. Um, sometimes nipple crusting or a new fluid coming out of the nipple, um, that could be a sign of, of breast cancer. Red or hot area, or maybe some skin sores. Um, a bump, something that's like protruding, like in that lemon there, um, growing veins. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here because I've worked in maternal child health. So normally when we see growing veins, that's a great sign of um, good milk supply. <laughs> um, so if you're lactating, this is not something probably you should be worried about. But if you um, are noticing growing veins and you're not lactating and um, this is new, then obviously that's something that we should be looking at. Um, a sunken nipple or a new shape or size, um, also an orange peel skin or a hard lump all signs of possible breast cancer. Um, and I do want to touch base too, I mentioned lactating. Um, for women who are breastfeeding, if you're doing your self-exam, um, it's important to number one, empty your breasts prior to doing your self-exam so that you can palpate a little easier. Um, so I wanted to point that out too, because you know, at age 40, some moms still are, um, are breastfeeding. So I just wanted to make sure I I pointed that out. So now we're going to talk about some myths and facts about breast cancer. Um, you know, many times I've heard the myth that antiperspirants and deodorants cause breast cancer. There is no scientific evidence actually supporting that. So this is definitely a myth. Um, healthy cancer-free breasts are not lumpy. Well, we know that's a myth because even Dr. Velez, right, she discussed um, lumps and bumps and how we all have lumps and bumps. We just have to know our own lumps and bumps so that if anything changes, we can um, have that looked at. So that is definitely a myth. And then wearing a bra can cause breast cancer. That's a myth. And if a woman bruises her breast, it can turn into breast cancer. That is also a myth. The only thing that can cause breast cancer is abnormal cells that are just growing out of control. Um, so we've talked about the myths. Now we're going to talk about some facts. Screen tests can help women find breast cancer early. We know that's a fact. Um, we know that early screening um, and, and finding, you know, even a breast cancer early, it's easier to treat. Um, and then a woman is at risk for developing breast cancer, even if no one in her family has had it. We know that that is also a fact. And the reason we know that is because 85% of most cases um, are in women who don't have any family history. So we're going to talk about some risk factors now. And some of these risk factors we have no control over, unfortunately. And then there's other risk factors that we do have some control over. So we're going to start on the left-hand side. And these risk factors we really have no control over. And the, the top two risk factors are being female and our age. We have absolutely no control over that. Um, so, you know, 
part of this, or part of the reason why women are at such a risk for breast cancer is because we have life, a lifetime exposure to estrogen. Um, estrogen is a hormone that our body develops and it maintains the female sex characteristics. And so, you know, we're exposed to this over our entire lifetime. Um, and often, you know, we have exposure around the age of 12 because that's when most um, young girls start their menstrual period. And then usually menopause occurs around age 55. And so during that time, we are exposed to estrogen and it's a daily thing that we experience, right? So um, that is the number one risk factor for women. And anyone or any woman who starts her menstrual period before the age of 12 has a greater risk because she has longer exposure of that estrogen. If a woman goes past 55 years old um, and she hasn't had menopause, she has an increased risk for breast cancer because she's had a longer period of time that she was exposed to estrogen. Um, family history is another thing that we don't have control over. So, um, you know, if we have family history of breast cancer, we know that that puts us at a greater risk um, and we don't have control over that either. So unfortunately, these are things we don't have control over. However, on the right-hand side of the screen, these are things that we can have some control over. Um, pregnancy is actually one thing that we can have some control over. Um, I know some cases you may not be able to have control, but um, pregnancy is actually, um, <sighs> it actually stops the estrogen. So, you know, when you're pregnant, you don't have a period. And so the estrogen is not released. Um, and if you're breastfeeding during, like while you're breastfeeding, if you're breastfeeding for exclusively for about a year, you also are not exposed to the estrogen because your body doesn't usually have a menstrual period. Um, so pregnancy and breastfeeding can actually help you. So if you've had babies and you've breastfed, you have reduced your risk for breast cancer, which is um, a great feeling. <laughs> um, being overweight, however, is a risk factor we can control um, usually, um, but being overweight can actually increase your risk for breast cancer. And that's because fat, um, fat cells store estrogen. And so, um, you, you're, you have more exposure <laughs> because we have, you know, um, those fat cells. Now, the, the hard thing is that, you know, we, number one, age is a big risk factor, right? We already discussed that. So age, weight, and we know that as we age, sometimes weight becomes an issue. Um, so those two things kind of go hand in hand. So just making sure that you're active, you're eating a healthy diet, um, and you're trying to maintain your weight, um, that can help reduce your risk. And then lack of exercise. So we do know that there is um, some evidence supporting that um, exercise can help reduce your risk for cancer. Um, and so if you're not exercising, you're increasing your risk. And then drinking alcohol and smoking also um, increases your risk. So, you know, I, I point out the alcohol because we often hear, you know, on the news, oh, a glass of wine a day isn't going to hurt you. Um, it's fine. But the scientific evidence um, is actually showing to th that alcohol affects women greatly, especially when um, breast cancer is involved. So if you have three drinks a week, you actually increase your breast cancer risk by 15%. And it doesn't matter if it's um, beer, wine, liquor, doesn't matter what kind, and you don't have to get drunk to have the effects of this. Um, it's just really drinking three glasses of alcohol a week um, that increases your risk by 15%. So stay away from the alcohol. And then smoking also, we know um, that also increases our risk and smoking increases our risk for many health issues, um, but it definitely affects your risk for cancer. So this is actually one of our last slides, and um, I just want to point out the picture um, of the beautiful 
bowl of fruit and veggies and grains um, and salmon. So I point out the salmon because, um, you know, as Americans, we love our red meat. <laughs> um, but red meat actually has some correlation um, to cancer because of the amount of fat um, in the red meat. And so we talked about that and estrogen levels. Um, so, so I want to just point out, like, it's, there's nothing wrong with eating red meat, but having it be um, like an addition to your meal is better than making the red meat the main part of your meal. So, you know, what I often even tell my children is, you know, eat like, you know, at least half of your plate should be vegetables and um, and healthy, healthy foods. Right. And then, you know, if you want to have the meat that should be, I always have, I tell my kids, eat your veggies first, um, and then your grains or your carbs and then your meat. Um, and, and, you know, if it's salmon or something like that, that's a little different, but if it is red meat, that's usually what I tell them because the red meat, um, should just be the extra not the main course. And I know in America, that's not how we look at things. <laughs> um, but that is the, what the scientific evidence is showing is that the more uh, fruits, vegetables, grains, or healthy grains, um, and you know, you eat the better um, outcome. So um, try to do a balanced diet, try to have a colorful diet, and that should help um, your overall health, as well as your risk for cancer. Uh, the other picture here shows yoga. So, um, you know, when we mention exercise, we know that it's important to exercise. We know that it affects our health. Um, you don't have to be in a gym working out two hours a day. Uh, you don't have to be running on a treadmill, um, but it is important to be active. It's important for your mental health and just your overall health. Um, so, so exercising and um, trying to relax trying to free your mind from the stress is really important too. Um, I wanna to point out the Know Your Lemons website again. I really encourage you to visit that website. It has wonderful information and um, they actually have an app as well. And you can download that app and it reminds you to do your self-assessment every month. Um, and they just have wonderful and a great, like a plethora of information. So I encourage you to visit that website as well. And then, you know, we've talked about treatment. We've talked about, or I'm sorry, not treatment. We've talked about screenings. We've talked about what we need to do. Um, but sometimes we forget that some people don't have access to care. And um, I, I think it's important that we share this information to ensure that everyone has the ability to have screenings. Um, everyone has access to healthcare. Um, so I'm going to touch base on this slide. Uh, this is DeKalb County. So if you're not in DeKalb County, um, I totally understand. We're going to go to another slide for those not in DeKalb County, obviously. Um, but, you know, there are resources available in DeKalb County for free breast exams and mammograms. And you can call this number below. If you're not in DeKalb County, you can go to um, the Illinois Breast and Cervical Cancer Program has um, established a program that allows women who are um, living in Illinois without insurance and age 35 to 64 years of age uh, to actually have free mammograms, breast exams, pelvic exams, and pap tests. So um, you can call this number that's listed on this slide as well. And I encourage you to share this information. Um, and I, I think even more with our economy and just, um, inflation, you know, people are having to make choices of what they can afford and what they can't. And so it's really important that we spread this information and share that there is access to care if you don't have it. Um, it's just knowing the resources. So please share this information if you can. And then that is all I have for tonight. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask. Um, and, and I do want to just touch base. There is an evaluation form um, that if you can fill out, I'd greatly appreciate it. Um, when you answer the questions, uh, the, qu the questions that are asked are based off of today's presentation. So it's your knowledge after the presentation and how you feel um, that has affected your knowledge. So um, thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate your time. I hope you learned something um, and we can do questions.
Great, thank you so much, Michelle. It's really been very informative. Um, we do have a couple questions, so uh, let me get to these. Um, someone says uh, their grandmother and their sister both had cancer, and they're asking about, I think it's the BRCA test, the BRCA um, test about the mutation, right? And uh, does that tend to be covered by Medicare? I know there are different Medicare plans. Yeah, so I'm not 100% sure on the coverage. I know that, um, and this was seven years ago when my mother passed, I know that it, it, was, it wasn't a cheap test. Um, so it was something we definitely discussed. <laughs> um, but, you know, ultimately for us, it was, um, it, it really boiled down to just how is it gonna affect the generations to come? And I know that that can be challenging. You know, I talk about inflation and costs and all of that, um, but it's definitely something to consider um, and, and really think about if it does run in your family, because just having that knowledge, sometimes you might even have more, more frequent screenings um, if you do indeed have that gene mutation. So I would definitely consider that. And I would talk to your doctor about it um, because they may have other resources too that could help you with that. Great, thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions here about um, dense breasts. The first mm -hmm. one is, what is your point of view of MBI versus a mammogram for dense breasts? So I guess MBI, what do they mean by MBI? Oh, I, that, um, yeah, we can ask um, the person to put in a clarification okay. of that. And let me then just move to this first one or the next one while, while we get that sorted. Um, can you please touch on um, having dense breasts in the mammography and signs to look for during a self-exam, like how, how having dense breasts affects those things? Okay, so um, when you have dense breasts, and I, I think I mentioned just briefly, you know, it's more tightly packed. So what I would suggest is just being very thorough, number one, with your self-assessments. Um, so, you know, when you're like in the video, when she was raising her arm, you know, making sure you're palpating different directions, sometimes um, different angles. Um, and it may end up that you're, you know, so your mammogram, how do I describe this? So, I, I, okay, okay, so when you're doing your self exams or self assessments, just make sure you're very thorough. So, um, and there's, if you go online, there's, and I can even send maybe a flyer that might give more detail on this of different ways to do your self assessment. And I'll, I will do that after this presentation. Um, but making sure you're just very thorough and you, and there's different motions, like the way you press on the breast either in a circular motion or from the outside coming into the nipple. Um, there's different ways. So I will send the flyer that I have so that you can see the different approaches. And I would try all of those approaches, like every single example, and maybe rotate that into your self-assessments because the more you are palpating, the more you know your breast, the sooner you're gonna identify the changes. Um, it is a lot harder to find things like that in a dense breast because it's so tightly packed. And even like I, I think I mentioned earlier um, on a mammogram, sometimes we find things later because of how tightly packed the breast is and we can't always get the best picture with a dense breast. So that's why yearly mammograms are extremely important if you have dense breast um, because then they have something to compare to each year. So if there's any changes, it's obvious compared to all of those other mammograms. Okay. And I'll send that flyer to you. Great, yes, and, and I can include that as an attachment in our follow-up. Um, and we do have a clarification. Um, this says, uh, they're referring to, uh, again, we're talking about dense breasts and the MBI test versus a mammogram. Uh, MBI oh. test for dense breasts detecting invasive duct um, AI carcinoma. I'm sorry, okay. I'm, not, I'm sorry if I'm not reading that right. I don't No, that's okay. So this may be something that I would probably have you talk to your doctor about specifically. And the reason why is because um, number one, we have all we all have different risk factors. And um, 
one test versus the other, it's not in my scope to, to identify which one is best for you. Um, so I think that that question needs to be referred to your doctor. Um, also, I am not an oncology nurse, so um, I don't feel like I'm an RN and I have experience in women's health, but I'm not an oncology nurse, so I don't feel like I should give you direction on that. Um, I, I would I would talk to your doctor about what he feels is best based off of your, you know, your previous mammograms, or um, maybe even, you know, we all have a variety of what our breast tissue is. So if yours is very dense, he may recommend the other test. Um, but I, I think that that is something that you need to talk to your doctor about, unfortunately. Right. They, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Um, you know, we don't want you to, to over overstep. And, and uh, I, I know that you're trying to be cautious of that. Um, they did clarify that they're talking about invasive ductal car carcinoma. Uh -huh. But again, um, not having the oncology specialty on um, that's something yeah. that they probably need to, to talk to their doctor about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another person is asking, can you please touch Oh, I'm sorry, uh, here, here we go. Uh, any connections between breast cancer and ovarian cancer? Uh, and if so, the best test for that connective, that connection? Yeah, so um, I'm gonna be very honest. So ovarian cancer, they call like the silent killer. Um, and, and the reason why, and I'll give my mom's example. Um, so there, there can be a correlation, number one, between the two because of the BRCA1, BRCA2 gene. So ovarian cancer and breast cancer are both associated with the BRCA1, BRCA2 gene. So if you've had breast cancer, they do often, and, and it runs in the family, they do often talk to you about that BRCA1, BRCA2 gene. Um, and there can be correlation between the two. Um, with ovarian cancer, um, and even with breast cancer, you know, you don't always know right away. Um, ovarian cancer is more of a silent killer because the symptoms um, don't always, so my mom's symptoms, I'll just give, I'm just gonna be very honest. <laughs> um, my mom's symptoms were more, um, I mean, she described it as it felt like acid was dripping into her stomach. So at first they thought that she had an ulcer. Um, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't associate that with ovarian cancer. And so that's why they call it the silent killer because there's other symptoms that occur and, and they treat you for other things because they think, you know, that it's something else. They don't go straight to cancer. Um, but unfortunately, as time went on, her symptoms, um, became more and more like she wasn't feeling good. Her, her stomach was hurting. She was vomiting. Um, she ended up, I came home for Christmas and she was gray. And I said, mama, like, what are you, what's going on? Like you, you, you look like you're dying. And, um, and so that's when we took her to the ED and, you know, she'd been treated for six months prior, um, at least six months prior and no one had found anything. Um, and then she went to the ED cause she was vomiting and throwing up and, um, was, you know, losing weight because she couldn't keep anything down. And that's when they found that she had stage three C ovarian cancer. So, um, you know, there are, there is some correlation there because of that BRCA1, BRCA2 gene. Um, I think that if you do have breast cancer that runs in the family or ovarian cancer, I think having that conversation with your doctor and asking them, what are my risks? Um, should I be screening more frequently? And I, I will be honest, again, I'm very open about my mom's experience and mine. So because she has had ovarian cancer, I have a, um, a vaginal ultrasound as well as my pap every year. And it's very important with ovarian cancer that you have your pap and you also have a pelvic exam. That is one of the things my mom did not have the year prior to her uh, being diagnosed with cancer. They did a pap. They did not do a pelvic exam on her. Every time you have your pap smear, you should have a pelvic exam done too. And if not, you need to ask them why they're not doing it. Because if they would have, the doctor stated that if they would have done a pelvic exam on my mom, they would have felt the size of her tumor. And so um, 
I go back to being your own advocate. If you do not have a pelvic exam done when you have a pap smear, you need to ask why. Um, and you need to say, I want that. <laughs> um, but I would talk to your doctor about your risk factors based off of your family history and see what his recommendation, his or her recommendations are. Thank you. And thank you, Michelle, for being, you know, so upfront and, and um, open about your experience. I think that really helps, you know, us personalize it and, and understand it so, so much better. So, so thank you. Uh, we've got another question here. The person says, uh, I am 66 and my doctor says um, that I only need a, pamp, a pap smear every um, three years. Um, it, is that correct? You know? Yeah. So, um, I have heard this occur, like where women are being told they don't have to have a pap smear. Um, and I, I think sometimes it's based off of your, your history. They haven't seen anything, you know, probably as of yet, I'm assuming this is all assumption. So, <laughs> um, and, and sometimes insurance probably plays a role in that too, unfortunately, which, um, I don't like, <laughs> um, because healthcare is healthcare and we need to be treated as, you know, we feel we should be treated. Um, and, and if we, I, I think the biggest thing is if you are having a gut feeling that you need to have a pap done, um, have that conversation with your doctor and ask him why he's recommending. Um, I, I, I am, since my mom's cancer, um, I am all for advocating for yourself. Um, so I think if you are not feeling at ease with that decision, I think you need to have that conversation with your doctor and you need to explain that to him or her. And, um, and then from there, um, you know, ask those questions as to, well, what are my risks by not having um, a pap smear done every year? Um, what are the negatives of this decision? What are the positives of this decision? Um, can you explain to me why this, why you're making this decision? Um, I think the whys are really important. And I think as females, sometimes we don't ask those questions and males too. Um, but we have to remember, and I, I, I teach prenatal care too. So I tell my moms, like, you have to remember that this is your baby and this is your pregnancy and this is your life. And the, the you know, this is, your gut feeling about a situation. So if you're not comfortable with that decision, you need to have that conversation. Um, and, you know, sometimes I know even for me, having a vaginal ultrasound every year, um, sometimes insurance doesn't like that, but because of my risk, as long as the doctor puts it in as that, you know, mom, the mother had ovarian cancer, I'm able to have that every year. Even if my insurance didn't pay for it, I probably would try to have it every year because I know how important that is for me. Um, so I think, you know, having that conversation with your doctor and really just going with your gut on that is really important. Well, thank you so much. It really helps empower us uh, for, you know, you're such a champion for self-advocacy. So thank you so much oh. for that. Uh, I think that it looks like it's the end of our questions. So uh, with that, uh, just uh, a comment that uh, we will be, this program has been recorded and so we'll put it up on the library's uh, YouTube page so that you can uh, share that link with a friend or watch it again. There's been great information here. I am gonna be sending out a follow-up email at, with uh, Michelle's contact information and a couple other sites I jotted down, um, that Know Your Lemon site, and mm -hmm. you're gonna send me uh, that yeah. fly as well that I can send as an attachment. So I'll wait for that. So you're going to get lots of great information in a follow-up email. If you are watching the recording of this program and would like those resources, just email me at ce at wheatonlibrary.org. That's ce for community engagement at wheatonlibrary.org. And I'd be happy to send those things out to you. So with that, I think, uh, again, I'm checking the the chat and uh, the Q&A, it, like, it looks like we're good. So um, thank you so much again, Michelle, for being with us tonight. Uh, thank you for everyone who attended. Uh, we hope everyone stays safe and healthy, and we hope to see you again soon. Good night. Good night.